Hello, dear friends. This is a live broadcast of History Lessons with Tamara Eagleman. It is impossible to say it's a good day on a day like this when the thought of Alexei Navalny's murder looms over us with such a dark shadow, a terrible cloud. And it is impossible, very difficult to think about anything else. I know that Ludmila Ivanovna, Alexei's mother, asked not to express condolences to her, but my heart breaks at the thought of Ludmila Ivanovna and Anatoly Ivanovich, these people who raised two such wonderful sons and have already suffered so much. And the thought that Alexei's mother is in cold, cell hard, far away, is beating on all doors trying to get the body of her son, her murdered son. And they tell her that they will give him out in two weeks while they conduct their investigative activities. In fact, while they cover their tracks of the crime. Today, Yulia Navalny shocked us with her courage, her resilience once again. But even on the stunning video of her addressing the situation published today, you could see how she's suffering and heartbroken, and it's impossible not to express your sympathy and your support for her. And of course, you want to think of Dasha and Zahar and Oleg and the whole family. You have become close, dear people, to us the last few years, even to those who have never seen you, never seen you in person, never known you. And I want to tell you that I, and not only I, am determined to follow Alexei's call not to give up, to fight till the end. And our live broadcast today is just one of the manifestations of this decision. Uh, we're going to talk about what Mr. Putin is doing to history. Please put likes. The more likes you put, the more people will see this. And I think it is important, very important. I'll try to answer all your questions at the end, but for that, you'll need to turn on. To do that, uh, you'll need to enable VPN. Well, we'll talk about the details at the end. So, everyone has probably already wondered more than once why Putin is always referring to history uninterruptedly. We have collected Putin's statements about history for this program. There are so many of them. At first, I thought that I would comment on each one. It's impossible. It would have lasted many, many hours. But of course, there is no surprise in this. In general, only a lazy politician in Russia does not refer to history. It's really a Russian peculiarity. Politicians always like to cite uh, historical examples, to look up to some historical characters. It's understandable. History provides an opportunity to address national identity, national pride, national vulnerability, a sense of victimhood, and similar things that are unfortunately very important for politics. But it can be addressed in different ways. And the authorities can do whatever they want with history and an authoritarian state. When all or most of the media are in the hands of the state, you can do whatever, whatever you want. You can abuse the unfortunate history in any way you want. And this is, of course, a very typical very characteristic thing. But if you think the painting that's on your screen right now is Facebook meme, uh, that's nothing like that. It's a painting by the artist Kirill Nikitich Karelov called Stalin at the Three Bogatars. And it seems to me that it's very relevant. It's actually today's reality. It could be pulled out of oblivion too. You see what a wonderful idea this is, to take a famous, well-known painting using historical images or legendary bolinas and 
put Comrade Stalin in this picture. That's the approach of an authoritarian state to history. Many of you have probably seen these two pictures, but uh, they are taken from a famous book by David King on which there was a wonderful exhibition, a book called The Commissar Vanishes. It's about how the state can manipulate seemingly indisputable information. We look at the photograph, well, it's a photograph. It's better to see it once than to hear it seven times. It's the way it is. But we see the original photo in which Stalin walks next to Yezhov. And after Yezhov was destroyed, oops, he's gone, and that's it. We can remember how Winston, the hero of Orwell's novel 1984, actually what did he do at work in the so-called Ministry of Truth? He was destroying information that didn't fit the current party line. That is, he was destroying history. He was changing history. And this is what always happens to history in any dictatorship, any whatsoever. And first of all, of course, any dictator needs history in any history to justify the present, the current things, to create a safety cushion, to create an ideological basis for what is going to happen later. Well, these wonderful caricatures, these images are not serious. They have emerged in recent days after the interview that Putin gave to the American journalist Tucker Carlson. And we understand the idea, actually. We're going to talk about this more. If you base your politics on events that happened not just yesterday, the day before yesterday, centuries ago, well, the others can do that as well. It's not that difficult. Mongolia can claim huge areas of Europe and Asia. Why not? And of course, there is a flaw, a very big flaw in this approach itself. We'll talk about that too. Well, here's a start. Let's look at how how these are the justifications in history. Vladimir Vladimirovich has met with historians and representatives of social sciences many times, and he has said interesting things many times. In 2007, he met with social scientists and said, we will not allow anyone to impose guilt on us. And this is a very clear thing. That is, we are not guilty of anything. This also runs through all the statements, and not only his ones, actually. In November 2014, he also said a very important thing. He said, historians must defend Russian positions in the informational space. More years have passed. November the 4th, 2022, a very interesting thing as well. So Putin met with historians and with representatives of traditional religions. A very interesting thing to unite scientists and educators with representatives of the clergy. He said a lot of interesting things there. Domestic history and culture are the basis of national identity, our mentality, traditional values, education of the younger generation, and, which is extremely important, the basis of Russian statehood. That is, Russian statehood is based on history, on the way we talk about the past, not on the current interest tasks, not on the needs of people, on the image of Russia, which, for this point of view, historians should create the cause of honor of the state, society, and of course, historians, is to protect our true history. That is the true history. There is no true history. And our heroes, heroes too. Here is history from the point of view of Russian propaganda. History is full of heroes from the point of view of Mr. Putin.
it is full of those who are ready to sacrifice their lives or other people's lives for the sake of state. To protect our true history and our heroes, to improve the quality of historical education. Well, um, first of all, I would like to say that historians and history don't owe anything to anyone. Not Putin, not Medinsky, not anyone from their entourage, and not anyone at all. History is free research. It is based on the impartial study of valuable facts, on their interpretation in accordance with what the scientists have learned, with respect for other people's opinion, with respect for the idea that there may be another interpretation of these facts. And to say that historians should defend something, accuse someone, serve someone, is to turn history into propaganda. Well, actually, that's what Mr. Putin and a lot of people around him do all the time. But once again, history owes them nothing. They have a debt to history, and it will get it, because history will write about everything they do, about wars of aggression, about innocent people killed, and much more. That's what's going to happen. But let's turn to more specific things. So this is very true, authentic history, which of course, from Vladimir Vladimirovich's point of view, is the only history there can be and no other, not even another single version. But the first idea which goes on all the time, it is said everywhere, written in plain text or implied, it is that we are always surrounded by enemies. Well, it has to be said that this is always the favorite way of propaganda. There are enemies all around. There are strangers coming to us, some others. There are Americans, the collective West. These are in those, and they want to ruin us. They want to destroy everything. And it's a very clever move because it's frightening. It's very dangerous. Well, those who are different are always a bit crazy. And if you pay on that, if you make it big, people get scared. When people are scared, they're easy to manipulate. Well, biologists would say that the limbic system is in the head right now, in motion, and all this part of our brain responsible for emotion, responsible for aggression. And it's turned on. And then it's very easy to take the next step. This is well shown in the same 1984, when there is a two-minute hatred and people are driven to terror, to hysteria by the description of enemies, picture of soldiers marching, the speech of the vile renegade Goldstein. And then what? Next comes the face of the big brother, because if we are frightened, we naturally think, who will protect us? The ruler? The ruler. Our ruler will protect us. That's what we're constantly being told. Let's start with this story, which seemed funny in 2020. Generated a lot of memes and jokes, and indeed it was very funny when suddenly Vladimir Vladimir said that it turns out that we were chased by Polovtsy and Pichinex. He had an online meeting with governors on April the 8th, 2020, when the COVID pandemic started. And he said, dear friends, everything passes and this will pass too. Our country has gone through serious trials more than once and the Pichinex tormented it and the Polovtsians. Russia has coped with everything. We have won and we will defeat this coronavirus too. 
Well, the idea is to call, to hold on, not to be afraid of the coronavirus. Everything is very good. Obviously, everyone was bumfounded. What kind of Pechenegs, what kind of Polovtsians? Many people didn't know what they were. Uh, there were a lot of different jokes, like why didn't he say about Mongols, about Drivlands, about dinosaur, about the ancient people? Game of Thrones fans came up with the following. We defeated the Dothrakis and White Walkers will defeat the great disease too. My favorite one of these memes is, an old man is sliding down the roof. He's obsessive as in Pechenik. And journalist Alexei Shevchenko wrote, here you are laughing at Pechenik and Polovtsy prevented Oveshkin from scoring 800 goals. And you know, it was really funny at that moment. Although I realize it's not so funny today. But I'm not even talking about the fact that there is such a racist flavor to it and all these incomprehensible comrades from Asia, scary, creepy ones, and we defeated them all. It's not by chance that I have a photo uh, on the slide, an excerpt from Borden's most um, famous work, the opera Prince Igor, the most important part of which, as we know, is the Polovitsyan dances. I must say that Burden was a man of quite nationalistic views, and he wrote Polovtsyn dances to show these terrible elements coming from the East against Christian civilization. Well, as we know, ironically, the Polovtsyn dances have become the most popular part of the opera Prince Igor, and perhaps it is performed more often than the whole opera itself. They are often performed separately. They are admired, their energy, their beauty. Well, maybe uh, to some extent, I'm not comparing, of course, Vladimir Vladimirovich's state with Polovtsyan dances, which are wonderful, but uh, it has generated some completely opposite reactions in the form of all these memes and jokes too. But seriously speaking, well, First of all, just a historian, I once had a long-lived broadcast dedicated to the Pechenegs and Polovtsians back in 2020. In brief, this idea that they always came and tormented us is not true. Relations with both the Pechenegs and the Polovtsians were very diverse. We fought with them, of course. There was such a thing. Well, I must say that the old Russian princess also often fought among themselves, and at the same time, they were made alliances with them. They went to fight against other enemies together, they married daughters, and there were many, many other things. Byzantine Emperor Constantine the Noble wrote about Pechenegs. Russians, in order not to deceive harm from them in view of the fact that these people are very strong, always tried to be in alliance with them and receive help from them. Well, here is Han Kanchak who will be the hero of the lay of the warfare waged by Igor and of Burden's opera. He was actually originally an ally of Prince Igor. They fought together against the princes of Kiev, the Manahachevich. And Igor's son married Konchak's daughter, so it's not a confrontation between East and West, as they tried to convince us. Well, you can look at what the old Russian princesses looked like, but uh, here is a famous image of Andrei Bogolubsky, a reconstruction made by Gerasimov, and you can see that he has a completely Asian look. It's clear why his mother was Polovtsyan. Maybe his grandmother was Polovtsyan too. After all, it was normal. It was a neighborly relationship. Neighbors once quarrel, sometimes even fight, and they sometimes are friends. These were their relations, and to turn neighboring nations into a scarecrow is, of course, uh, wrong from the point of view of history, and it indicates a certain political tendency. Since ancient times, we have always been surrounded by enemies, and this can also be seen in various statements of Vladimir Vladimirovich. Well, in his interview with Carlson, he mentions the night dogs of, uh, who also attacked us. Well, it's clear Alexander Nevsky Korin portrays him as a defender, but a um, defender against the collective West, against their terrible invasion. He defeated them in a grandiose battle of Lake Patsy and in the sunny ice battle. 
but we don't even want to waste time on this today, but it is very well known that not a single historian before Sergei Eisenstein made his great movie, Alexander Nevsky, no historian took this battle of the Ice Age seriously. It was not in the history books, in the major histories of Russia. Well, they briefly mentioned a small skirmish. Eisenstein, who brilliantly filmed a clash between the forces of good and evil, created this image, which, of course, worked for propaganda. And as we know, this great but completely false from the historical point of view movie ends when Nevsky threateningly says, whoever comes to us with a sword will be killed by that sword. Again, this is the thing that we are about to see in the most different examples, that someone is always coming at us with a sword and we have to fight back. We have the right to do so. And how can we do that otherwise? But this idea is also clearly, very clearly, very clearly carried out in the notorious textbooks written by Medinsky and Turkunov. Although, in fact, by completely different people, where this idea is given on the example of the 20th century, because it turns out that all the time, either the United States or Western propaganda or Ukrainian and Lusanian racialists were playing tricks on us that we should defend ourselves. That's why we put troops into Hungary, that's why we put troops into Czechoslovakia, that's why we put troops in Afghanistan, and how could we not put troops in Ukraine? God told us to, because everyone is attacking us all the time. That's a favorite thought. Another very important point in history, which Putin refers to very often for obvious reasons, is the unfortunate day of national unity. People's Unity Day, the not so long ago introduced holiday on November 4th, but in general it was invented when they canceled the day off on November 7th, but people had to replace it somehow. So they started looking for something and invented November 4th. Oh, how suddenly it began to unfold the day of national unity. What happened there? The Poles were defeated in 1612. No one remembered about it except for historians, and suddenly it turned out to be the most important event. Of course, the collective West came to us and we destroyed them. That's how great it was. A very characteristic thing is that there is no human popular celebration of this day. And there are official speeches, meetings, gatherings, and so on and so forth. And marches by nationalists who very quickly realize that this is a day for them. That's when we destroyed them. Well, Vladimir Vladimirovich is speaking out, speaking out. Here is the same meeting on November 4th, 2022, which I have already quoted. The origins of the holiday go back centuries to the feet of the people who themselves rose up to fight for their country, cleansed it of strife, treachery, humiliation, united, ended the turmoil, restored legitimate power in our united statehood. Oh, he likes this unified statehood very much. All he said to Carlson about a unified, centralized state that was, was an outdated term. He's now showing that November 4th is, as it turns out, one of the most important holidays. Actually, in my unenlightened opinion, if we talk about the turmoil, we should not talk about how the Poles were driven out or all. It was an important matter, of course. It was not primitive, as Putin is trying to show us, because, for example, how did the Poles get into the Kremlin in the first place, because the boyars themselves, after the overthrow of Vasily Shusky, invited the Polish king Vladislav for the reign, and he was afraid to go. And he realized who he was messing with, but he sent the Polish garrison. A much more important legacy of the turmoil is the fact that it was a time when society was active, when Zimtso councils decided the fate of the country, when the most diverse social forces rose up to defend the country, 
and not just to prosecute foreigners, but to defend their rights. And by the way, a very interesting thing. Everyone says how Vladimir Vladimirovich likes to read Kluchevsky. I don't really believe, but Kluchevsky was wonderful lectures on the turmoil and the time after the turmoil. And he shows very well how the Western influence in Russia increased under the influence of the turmoil. We fought with foreigners, but again, they were not scary devils with horns. They were people who lived in Moscow when they came with false Dmitry and Marina Mnishek. They were people with whom we communicated, whom we looked at and thought that they had better weapons and they had this, but we didn't. They wanted to borrow a lot. And the turmoil was a confrontation with Poland, of course, but it was also borrowing from Poland. But of course, the most important thing for Putin and for all the propaganda is that the Pajnegs and the Paltians were enemies, the Horde, the Mongols were enemies. We don't want to talk about Mongols so often, so it's not to offend Tatarstan, but the Western Knights were enemies, Livonian Poles were enemies. There are special claims to Poland. We'll get to that later. There were enemies all the time. And when it comes to the 20th century, we're already prepared by all the study of history, by all these numerous statements that someone attacked us all the time, all the time. And therefore, of course, we were attacked by fascists. I have already talked about it many times, how propaganda uses World War II, and today we will talk about it too. But we need to understand that the word fascist, Nazi, has become a label that is applied to anyone who wants to humiliate, to denigrate, to create an image of an enemy, as it happens with Ukraine. Because it is a reference to the trauma of war, which propaganda skillfully uses. And in the same way, there were fascists, there were Nazis in Ukraine now, and then there is the scary NATO. NATO is actually defense alliance. And NATO was, of course, created in order to defend itself from the Soviet Union, which was extremely aggressive back then. But let's remember how the Partnership for Peace developed in the 1990s when relations with NATO were developing and there was every opportunity, maybe even for Russia to join NATO as wild as it sounds today, but at any rate, to develop relations. But we went in a completely different way. And that's why we have to say as terrible as the fascist threat is until today, as terrible as the NATO threat is, there are enemies all the time. And now there are also a whole new notion of genocide of the Soviet people, which we'll talk about more. And this concept, it very skillfully connects the two thoughts that I started with when Putin told the public that we will not let anyone impose guilt on us. That is, we will not be guilty of anything. And then the idea that history should protect, explain about our enemies. Enemies are coming at us all the time. We're unfortunate victims all the time. There are Pachinets, fascists, NATO, um, someone else. And that's why we have the right. The victim has the right to a lot. At least that's how it seems. Well. And uh, another thing, if we have to defend ourselves all the time, we need to be strong. And the main task of the state is strength, of course. Not taking care of its people, not comfortable life, not special social policy, strength so that we can kick everybody's ass. And why will we crunch them? We're not aggressors, we're just defending ourselves. Here we are, on the one hand, we're unfortunate victims, and on the other hand, we're peaceful people, but our armored train stands on the reserve track, and then he comes out of the reserve track. And Putin's favorite, uh, favorite philosophers, well, uh, or his entourage, I'm always asked about this, 
it seems to me, frankly speaking, that he himself did not read any of them, and all of them um, informed him. Well, I don't know, but in any case, Lin Dugin, well, I do not want to talk about Dugin at all. He seems like some kind of crazy person to me. Lin at least had some coherent, um, some kind of consistent idea, but it is absolutely clear to them that we have the right to defend ourselves. And besides that, we have the right to impose our values on everyone. Well, at least on those around us, because this is the Russian world. This is the Russian idea. You believe that there are leading nations and there are those following you. And he always thought it was very good for everybody. We're the main ones. We will explain everything to everyone. And so the more territories are covered by this Russian world, the safer it is for Russia and the better it is for everyone. But these words of Putin, which uh, have been quoted many times, that the biggest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century was uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union. And it should be said again that in the textbook by Medizky and Turkunov, these words are said as an epigraph and being everything goes through this. We had such a great life and the enemies dog, 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 and to interfered, interfered, interfered with us. We defended ourselves from them, defended ourselves, and they ruined the Soviet Union. But we'll, well, let's say, keep its values. Here's a very interesting thing, because the Soviet Union, for all the understandable horrors uh, the policy of Bolsheviks, uh, including the national one, for all the falsity of talk about the friendship of people. But Soviet Union, in any case, uh, created national republics. Why does Putin dislike Lenin so much? He created national republics, which were somehow under Bolshevik control, but developed their own culture, their own language, and so on. Well, let's um, not go into that now. Russia is now the legal successor of the Soviet Union, but of course, it uh, doesn't carry any communist ideas, not, God forbid, any proletarian internationalism. It carries this big Russian idea. In January 2012, Vladimir Vladimirovich unleashed a big article. Let's remember January 2012. The elections are approaching. And there are stronger and stronger speeches for fair elections, with which passing week rallies in Moscow and St. Petersburg. The authorities are getting nervous. And what does our president write at this moment? Uh, let's uh, look at that. Uh, there is a special subtitle, Civil and Inter-Ethic Harmony. The most developed and prosperous countries, which previously prided themselves on their tolerance, are facing the aggravation of the national question. So the national question is important everywhere, but they've got their issues too. Are you accusing us of something? Look at yourselves. You were proud of your tolerance, and now the national question has uh, escalated. Next, a wonderful phrase. Behind the failure of the multicultural project, is the crisis of the very model of the nation state. Well, what can I say? The nation state is a very complex concept. It is far from ideal indeed. Multiculturalism has many problems, but I would not be so quick to say that this project has already collapsed. But uh, what is more interesting is that Vladimir Vladimirovich is opposing. It's clear, the empire, Russia emerged and developed for centuries as a multinational state. That is, we have so many peoples and everyone is well. Then he amazingly substantiates it. He says, the tale of bygone years proves the multinational character of the old Russian state. In general, there were no nations yet in ancient Russia. All right, let's leave it at that. Here's a quote. Who speaks Slavic in Russia? 
Poland's Drevlyansk Novogordians, Polachans, Dregovici, Northmen, Gujans. This is an interesting enumeration because it names those Slavic tribes that lived in the territories of not only present-day Russia, but also present-day Ukraine and Belarus. But other people uh, here, Chad, uh, Merha, Ves, Muroma, uh, Chermis, and so on, these speak uh, their own languages. They say, we have always been a multicultural state, but the core that holds together the fabric of this unique civilization is the Russian people, Russian culture. But remember one thing right away, Stalin's toast to the Russian people at the victory uh, reception and how this idea that the Russian people are the elder brother of all the other people, it immediately took a hold. The word elder brother is not said, but it is a binding fabric. It is the core. And why? Because our identity has a different cultural code sawn into us, not like the West with their nation state. And the Russian people are state forming for this code. The preservation of the Russian culture dominant is a task um, carried out not only by ethnic Russians, but by all the bearers of this identity, regardless of nationality. And that is, in fact, it turns out that all people, all people who live in Russia, who have lived in the Russian Empire, in the Soviet Union, or in the Russian Federation now, all these peoples, they have some kind of a common cultural code. This is also a very interesting question. How is this code sawn into us? It is genetically transmitted, or then we are already moving somewhere towards fascism. All right, so somehow everyone has this cultural code, which recognizes Russian culture, the Russian people as the state for mating nation, which means Russian culture is a binding force. That is, all people have already been coded in advance that the Russians are in charge and they are not. How can this be? How can this even be? How can the head of a multinational state say such a thing? And it seems to me that it's not just because you read Ilyin or was told about the Russian idea. Uh, there is a, a viciousness here that is mm, very characteristic not only for Putin, but of Soviet propaganda in general. The person himself does not matter. That person is important, interesting, only because of the community to which he belongs. And the nation is one of the most important communities. Here is uh, the Russian nation, so important, incredible, good, which takes care of everyone. And there are Ukrainian, Belarusian, Buryats, Chechen, whatever kind of people. And uh, what kind of people are they? What are their rights? What do they think about? This is not taken into account at all. Well, let's face it, respect for human beings is not a trait that is characteristic of Putin or of our country in general. Um, he goes on to say, we count on the active participation of Russians' traditional religions in the dialogue well, I mean multicultural dialogue. This is also a very characteristic thing. So we will rely on staples, uh, autocracy, orthodoxy, and nationality. And uh, in the era of Nicholas I, of course, orthodoxy was perceived as the most important religion. But at the same time, for example, Nicholas did not very much approve of the transition from the other religions to orthodoxy. But if he did, of course, if his relatives discouraged him, uh, it was punished. But in principle, it's good to stick to the religion of your ancestors, its staples, and all traditional religions will teach you to obey the state. And it's pretty much the same thing you. We will strengthen our historical state inherited from our ancestors. Well, that is this empire. We have lived together for centuries. We won the worst war together. Well, of course. A reference to war, it's impossible to go without it, but we'll talk about war a little later. First, let's see how he constantly, thoughtfully proves that 
there was this united Russian world, literally from the very beginning of the Russian state. Of course, this um, is the first of all proved by the examples of the history of Ukraine, which uh, so much has been done that it makes one's eyes water. So here's the most important idea, how uh, Kievan Rus developed in general. It's very interesting, you know, when I was studying at the university, there was a concept of Kievan Rus, but academicians, uh, especially Rubikov and other nationalist historians liked to say that the main thing is Kievan Rus, because some Vikings came to Novgorod from the West. It's unclear who that was. Well, some collective West. And there are people in Kiev, Slavs, that's it. Now we have another turn. In Kiev, it's unclear who is in Kiev. And here in Novgorod are the original Russian lands. And on the other hand, Novgorod is the center, but as Putin told all this to Carlson, Novgorod was the center, the Novgorod princes captured Kiev, sub subjugated it, and so they get impression that Novgorod was the main center of this supposedly centralized state. It was not centralized at all. This is a fantasy for the 10th and 11th centuries. So they seized it, and it became a single state, the basis of the future Russia. But there are no peculiarities. For example, the southern Russia, they don't exist at all. But a wonderful uh, American scholar, Timothy Snyder, a very major expert on the history of Eastern Europe and the history of Ukraine in particular, he often comments on Putin's statements. By the way, his wonderful course on uh, the history of Ukraine, which he gives at Yale University. It's openly available on the web. Uh, you can listen to it. You can learn a lot of interesting things, and you can see how the scholar talks about it. Um, he writes, commenting on the text, uh, a next statement that uh, there is no difference between the Russia and the Ukrainian people, because there has always been one nation. He writes that his, meaning Putin's, statement that Russia, Ukraine, and other nations make up one country because of something that happened a thousand years ago defies all the logic. And this, I think, is a very important point. You see the question of how different Southern and Northern Rus were Kievan Rus, Novgorod Rus, to put it conditionally, is a very interesting scientific question. Archaeologists, historians, linguists are engaged in it. There are different opinions. In the 19th century, the prevailing opinion was that it was all a unity, not uh, differentiated at all. And uh, Malarosia and uh, Belarusia, um, as they said at that time, did not differ in any way, only slightly. By the way, for example, many people in Ukraine also thought so at the time. Then the opinion changed. A prominent Ukrainian historian, one of the most important Ukrainian historians, Mikhailo Hrushevsky, formulated the idea that Ukraine, the skill and Rus, was absolutely nothing to do with northern Rus. And uh, Ukrainians uh, developed in their own way. We will as I understand. This concept is also highly questionable today. But these are scientific works. You can discuss it, you can argue with it, you can agree, disagree, give arguments, but in no way use it for military aggression, for politics in general. What difference does it make what was a thousand years ago? There are different states today. That's the main thing. There was one state. And this is the ancestor of Russia. And this is continued further at uh, different uh, stages. But um, yet again, he also diligently told Carlson about how Khmelnytsky wanted to unite with uh, Moscow and wrote a letter to Moscow. Uh, indeed, Khmelnytsky did write a letter. It's undoubtedly that 
Not only that, it's undoubtedly that in Ukraine, the future Ukraine land subordinated to Poland, there were many people, first of all, representatives of the clergy who thought that we should orient ourselves towards Moscow because Moscow is orthodox. The Poles are Catholics, so uh, that's our way there. But first of all, um, as uh, for the Cossacks, uh, Khmelnytsky apparently uh, there are many different versions. I refer everyone to the history of Ukraine at the same time lecture. Uh, well, Khmelnytsky, uh, of course, dreamed of a Cossack state and even began to actually create it. Well, or at least a Cossack autonomy. He needed to realize that. He needed to realize that, unfortunately, he couldn't stand alone. He needed some kind of a patron. So he started looking for one, and he tried to negotiate with the Polish kid, and did work. He tried to negotiate with the Ottoman Sultan. But there are Christian, there were Christian principalities, uh, Moldavia, uh, Latvia, present-day Moldova, Romania. Uh, they were subject to the Ottoman Sultan. They had their own Christian rulers, but they pay tribute to the sultan if necessary. You went to war with him. Uh, for some time, Holnitsky considered such an option that maybe to Kui that there would be a Ukrainian principality or whatever it would be called, uh, Hetman Hood. Uh, and the sultan, he was far away, would be considered the main one. The sultan turned out to be a very reliable ally. Then they turned to Moscow. and. It is confirmed by many sources that when uh, they discussed the details of uh, unification of the Perslavo Rada in 1654, it turned out that the Cossacks thought of it in one way and the representative Moscow's in another way. The Cossacks thought that they would have a huge autonomy and the Moscow Tsar would protect them. The representatives of Moscow's Tsar said, no, you will obey. Well, from here, as we know, uh, many, many other things grew, Mazeppa and many more. But for Putin, all of these talks, all these historical subtleties, uh, all these historical problems, they don't exist at all. He needs to prove that uh, Ukraine is Russia. So let's twist history like this. We will take one version that really exists, that he did not invent at all, uh, not his speechwriters, and we will declare the rest completely false. We'll act on that version. That's a very convenient way of doing it. And uh, this is also very well seen in a moment, which kind of slipped in the background of everything that is done with Ukrainian history and Ukraine today. What was said about the Finna Ukrik people, it somehow passed. Well, they laughed and kind of forgot, although who knows, who knows? In 2022, Putin came to the exhibition Peter the Great, Birth of an Empire, and said, Peter the Great fought the Northern War for 21 years. It would seem that he fought Sweden and rejected something there. He did not take away anything. He gave it back. Well, we know that in another statement, he confused the Northern War with the Seven Years' War. Okay, I'll forgive him, it happens. Everyone can make mistakes, everyone can show that they don't know something. But this idea that Peter wasn't taking from the Swedes, he was returning native Russian land. In May 2023, he will speak out and say, attempts to divide the Russian and finno ukrik people, but it is also funny that it turns out there is one finno ukrik people uh, have absolutely no basis, no ground, and will certainly be doomed to be failure. What can be said about that? A lot of things can be said. Here's if, say, it can be juggled with Russia and Ukraine. It's easier to juggle, uh, let's put it this way, because the languages are very close, because a lot of people in Ukraine speak Russian, so it's kind of easier to prove. And the Finno-Ugrians, they're kind of different 
Finland, yeah, it was part of the Russian Empire for a little over a century, but then it existed separately. So just say that these are all our lands is not going to do it. Although I think that both Estonia and Finland got very tense after all these statements were made. And maybe this current tension, and there are many actions today in particular stem from that. So Putin's main idea is that we've been living with the Finno Ukrit people together perfectly, wonderfully, always together. You see, when they say that they have lived together, we already understand what it means in his mouth. We can say the following, the Finno Ugrians indeed, judging by all appearances, had quite peaceful relations in ancient times. Historians prove this on the basis of onomastics on the names of places, first of all, on the names of rivers, not on uh, onomastics on uh, toponymy, uh, of course, uh, first of all, on uh, hydronymics. The names of rivers are preserved the longest. A village can be renamed, but a river usually stays the way. Uh, and it is very well seen, especially in antiquity, that Slavic names in the northern part of Russia are interspersed with Finna Ukuk names. That is, there was no such thing as wall to wall, but there was a lot of space. They lived, neighbored, and it was fine. Now, obviously, it was so somewhere before 10th century. There were also Baltic people. There is also a notion of Finno Baltic unity with them. Well, let's leave it at that. Everything was mixed up there. But further on, states emerge. Russian principalities are formed. By the way, uh, the Lithuanian principality is formed. And these poor Finna Ugric numerous tribes begin to crash all these states. I talked about this in the lecture about the medieval Volga region, where you can see it very well, because a huge part of the population of the Volga region is Finna Ugric. Uh, and as the Vladimir Suzu land, Rostov land, as princes come from there, princely detachments collected taxes as they begin begin to uh, subjugate. And as soon as um, Putin spoke about this peaceful life, experts in Finnair history immediately said, wait, there were a lot of military campaigns. We know how much Novgorod fought with different Finnair people. And uh, even in later times, even the terrible annexed the uh, Hanate of Kazan and Ostrakhan. That is, um, he got uh, the whole uh, Volga region here. And uh, uh, during uh, several decades, the 70s, 80s, 90s of the 16th century, there were so-called Charmis Wars. That is, um, they were wars with the Mari. The Mari, who had been subordinated by to the Kazan Khan before, well, they were not oppressed in any way. And here came Russian tax collectors from Moscow. One foreign traveler who later, uh, however, traveled through these places, Isaac Massa, wrote, the Udmurts paid taxes to every Russian who came to them in boots. And it happened that they paid four times a year. And so the Mari Udmurts rebelled did not want to obey. It was as if uh, there was no such thing. Oh, we were always friends. Oh, everything was always good and wonderful. And it is especially interesting with those lands, which in the Middle Ages were called uh, the Vodskaya land, where the Nogodians came very strongly, strengthened their influence. And Izhora, well, uh, the territories between Novgorod and, and today St. Petersburg. And uh, there was such a very mixed population there. And from the 14th century, uh, the Novgorodians uh, built uh, their fortress here and uh, tried to subdue these tribes, and they did. And it was all gradually changing there. They kept their languages, their customs, their pagan beliefs for a long time. Well, let's say by the beginning of the 16th century, they are mostly orthodox and even mostly speak Russian. But it is preserved. No, no um, sorry, I said it wrong. They speak Russian and wear Russian clothes, but there are still a lot of pagan shrines. Then orthodoxy spreads. Let's say by the end of the 16th century, they are already mostly all orthodox. These Finna Ugrians, and of course, um, there is there is a process of their 
uh, betrothal, their fusion with representatives of the Russian people, uh, with the new Russian people. Um, then, at the beginning of the 17th century, these lands will be seized by the Swedes. And when Peter the Great starts his northern war, he will emphasize what Putin said in every possible way, that uh, I'm not seizing, I'm reclaiming what's mine. When uh, they take away the fortress of Reshek from the Swedes, uh, where Schüsselburg will later be, Peter will order to mend the metal. I've been at the enemy for 90 years. And when they went further to the Finna Ugrug territories, Peter um, thought that uh, these were our lands, that these are our lands. No one should be offended here. Everyone should be welcome here. But it was practically only Peter who thought that way. There is a wonderful book by Tatiana Anatolovna Bazarova uh, called Creating Paradise, but it is a book about completely different subjects, about how St. Petersburg was created. But before that, she describes the situation during the war. And Peter was saying, these are our people, these are our lands, don't offend anybody. Uh, what was going on there was a complete nightmare. Russian soldiers came, burned the land, took hostages, or sent local people as spies to the Swedish territory, led their wives as hostages, they ran away from them. And it is very well seen uh, that uh, they mostly cooperated with the Swedes, actually. In general, during these decades, when these uh, lands were controlled by the Swedes, most of the Orthodox Christians who spoke Russian went to the Russian territories and they were settled there by Finna Ugri people who came from the Finnish and Swedish lands, who did not consider the army of Peter the Great as their own, and did not consider them to be helping what they were being returned to their historical homeland. Um, this is very well seen and proven again by many sources. And in fact, this is such an incomprehensible move. Let's hope that Putin has already abandoned this move about the Finnegrins and that Finland and Estonia can sleep well, but um, it is very revealing. These were our lands. And it was not abandoned. And basically the same move played out with Crimea. So what it turns out is that well, uh, mm, Crimea is, uh, well, the cradle of uh, Russian orthodoxy, the original Russian land that has always belonged to Russia, which is absolutely contrary, not just to history, but to common sense. And it's not accident that I put different images here. So ancient Greeks lived in Crimea. Ancient finds uh, uh, have been preserved there. Well, let Greece claim their right to Crimea for many, for several centuries, Crimea belonged to the Horde, actually. When the Golden Horde has collapsed, the Crimean Hanate remained. It will exist the longest from all racks of the Golden Horde till the second half of the 18th century. Well, let Mongolia, as in a joke, it is Mongols who joke about it now, let Mongolia declare the right on Rome. And everyone who's ever vacationed in the Crimea, remember the uh, Genese fortress in Sudak, it did not come from nowhere. Um, Italian merchants lived there. They also had land here. They built their fortresses here. Maybe not Italy will claim its rights to Crimea. This all seems like nonsense, but actually it is just as nonsense as saying that Russia has the right to the Crimea. Because um, if you believe, uh, if you believe the annals, which is still a big question to believe or not, that Prince Vladimir was baptized there. Well, first of all, the annals were written down a century or more after the baptism of Russia. 
Secondly, there were two tales which are combined together. The Vladimir is first baptized in Korshin in uh, Chersonese, well, that is on the territory of present Sevastopol, and then in Kiev. So we don't know which one is correct. Thirdly, as one historian very wittily remarked, well, okay, Vladimir captured Korshin. Uh, he was a Kiev prince, so maybe that's just proof that Crimea is Ukrainian, but it's not really proof of anything because it's crazy to rely on these stories, especially uh, since uh, there's so much closer story. 1994, the Budapest Memorandum, where Russia, along with America and Great Britain, pledged to guarantee the Ukrainian territorial integrity in exchange for Ukraine giving up atomic weapons. That's it. What does Vladimir have to do with it? What does this have to do with some antiquities. This is such a fake bridge. And this bridge is supported by numerous arguments about language, about what it means that uh, there is allegedly no Ukrainian language. In the interview with Tucker Carlson, he talks about uh, ancient um, Russia. One territory, one economic relation, one language, and after the baptism of Russia, one faith and the power of the prince. Well, I have already written texts and analyzed the statement. No uniform territory. There were different grounds, as uh, the Chronicles write, um, which formerly were considered belonging to Lurikovichs. Uh, and by the way, the center of these lands were in Kiev. Economic ties, but this is not applicable to that time at all. What kind of economic ties are there? Yes, there was a way from the uh, Varangians to the Greeks, so they passed along the rivers, but um, what if you imagine that they were trading some Chernigov goods uh, with Novgorod goods? Uh, so faith, there was a question with faith, because paganism remained very strong for many centuries, and it was different. So language. Supposedly, there was one language. And what happened then? Then he says that the Poles, so in those centuries, when the Ukrainian lands were part of the current uh, duchy of Lithuania, uh, then Poland, then the Polish and Lithuania, and the Commonwealth, Poles were introducing their language, says Lyman Vladimirovich. And then later, speaking of more contemporary events, he says that Russia and uh, Ukraine actually share a common language. More than 90% spoke Russian there. Well, it is clearly stated, one language from ancient times to our times. The Poles, of course, tried to do something. It's unclear what exactly, but it is one language. This is the proof that Ukraine and Russia are one people. Well, again, no, this is a linguistic issue where you can argue, you can give reasons, but not use it for political action in any way. The eminent linguist Andrei Anatolovich uh, Zunisnyak uh, has done a lot of research on northern dialects, Pskov dialect, Novgorod dialect. He has a work called Ancient Novgorod Dialect. And he tells us that in the Middle Ages, several dialects were used on the territory of ancient Novgorod. There was the church Slavonic language, understandably, for church services. And then what he calls the standard of old Russian language and writes that it was the most prestigious language in the whole territory of ancient Russia. And most likely, it was oriented to the Kiev dialect. And also in Novgorod land, uh, the standard language was uh, mm, mainly used in official documents and uh, later um, later on, in addition, there was an ancient Pskov dialect, East Slavic dialect, Novgorod dialect, a lot of things like that. But what was going on? So according to Zuznak, and it's not for us to argue with the great linguist, the standard Kiev dialect was more or less the same for all of Kievan Rus uh, until the end of the 13th century. And further, different state associations began to form their own um, their own dialects, which became the basis of future languages. In particular, well, Zhuznak uh, believes that Novgorod formed uh, its own language. If the Novgorod principality had remained independent, there would be a separate Novgorod language today. 
of course, similar to Russian, to Ukrainian, to Belarusian, but different from it. But this is not happened because Novgorod was absorbed by Moscow in a single, um, well, say the great Russian dialect was formed. And then the southern lands were part of Lithuania, part of Poland, and no one imposed any language on them. That's how it can be imagined. There is the 16th century, Polish landlords come, they um, say to their peasants, well, everybody speak Polish. Why do you want to speak Russian here? The landlord doesn't care who speaks what. He wants the peasants to work on the Barshina and pay their taxes. The majority of landowners uh, spoke Polish, of course. Although it developed in the 16th century, the Orthodox elite was formed, which would uh, also speak some Slavic language. Uh, and gradually the difference between the Southern and Northern dialects which already existed in the 10th and 11th centuries, will become stronger. And uh, they become even stronger and stronger and different languages emerge. And when it is said that there is no Ukrainian language at all, that what about Tara Sivchenka, Lesse Ukrainka, Ivan Franko, a huge number of other people who wrote in this language are crossed out, right? Okay, you can always say, well, peasants, they don't understand what they speak, they have some kind of language. There is already literature in Ukraine in the 19th century. It is not by chance that I have placed here a shot from Parajanov's movie, Shadows of Forgotten Ancestors, a genius movie by an amazing director, an uh, Armenian from Tbilisi who found himself in Kiev on his own misfortune from where he would end up in the camp, but he was also so shocked by the culture, in particular the Hutsul culture, and the story by uh, Kotsubniski, that he made his amazing movie. And it's enough to look at that movie to realize that, first of all, he used the Ukrainian language, and uh, you can see that it's completely uh, different culture. There is something in it that uh, we may be familiar with, and something completely different. That's why I give the example of Barajanov, because he was looking from the outside, and he saw all these differences, and he saw, and he was fascinated by them. Well, not because they were different from Russian culture, but simply because of their peculiarities. And he filmed this masterpiece. And, uh, well, uh, in 2023, after the full-scale invasion, uh, Putin held a meeting of the Council of Interethnic Relations and said it would be good to know that even the Mordovian people have five dialects, and the people who use these dialects are rather far away from each other. They don't understand each other. But the idea is clear. He cares very little about the Mordovian dialect, but the idea that, aha, there is a Ukrainian dialect, we do not consider it a language, only nationalists develop it. And uh, the main notion that forms the state in is the Russian people. Russian culture is the leading culture. They used uh, the Russian language in Mordovia to understand each other, and this is how it should be everywhere. And Ukraine is being deprived of its language. And there are several flaws here. First of all, well, there's a lot of linguistic evidence that is completely ignored and about how, well, if we go back to the Ukrainian language, how the Ukrainian language differs from the Russian language. It ignores the culture situation where, again, let's say I'm not a linguist. It may very well be those uh, who say that there are different dialects, southern and northern dialects. Let's assume that they were wrong, although it seems to me that they were not. But there is literature in 19th century in Ukrainian. They were the ones who wrote literature. Was it in some jargon, in Surzhik, in dialect, it doesn't happen like that. 
they have already created this language, all based on what was before. And uh, the other thing is that when one equates language and identity, there is no coincidence that he said, um, there's 90% who speak Russian in Ukraine. Well, I don't know where that figure came from. The fact that 90% understand, know Russian and use it, it's probably more than 90, it's understandable. Does that mean um, they are Russians? Uh, the question of national identity is much more complicated than Vladimir Vladimirovich makes it seem. This map shows those countries um, around the world where English is spoken. Does that mean that Australians are English? Does it mean that Americans are English and uh, many other nationalities? It's very calm, very complicated. It's all adds up. A huge number of those who are somehow called small people on the territory of Russia, maybe uh, small people for the North as well, but it is exactly the same way, say, Indian tribes in Northern America and South America. Uh, unfortunately, there are people who are losing their languages, and uh, this is a terrible damage for the world culture. But at the same time, there are those of these people who are preserving their identity. Well, I'm not talking about the state of Israel, where Jews from all over the world come to learn Hebrew, but they continue to speak Russian, French, Ukrainian, and many other languages. And uh, that doesn't define them or to find something in their identity, but it doesn't make them who they are. And again, the main thing is that these are all very interesting and complex scientific questions, in my opinion, cultural, linguistic, historical. Uh, what does politics have to do with it? What does aggression have to do with it? And they're not only justifying the war in Ukraine, but this great mystical mission of the Russian people. Uh, but we'll come back to this too. But if we continue to talk about Ukraine, the next point, which is repeatedly found in Vladimir Vladimirovich's statement, is that actually there was no Ukraine. So there was no separate uh, Kievan Rus. There was no Ukrainian language. And there was no state of Ukraine. And as, as we know, Vladimir Lenin created Ukraine, as uh, always uh, uh, what terribly annoys me is that some piece of reality is taken from a whole, and then everything is turned around. We understand perfectly well that indeed, after the revolution, well, by permission of Lenin and the Central Committee, the Sovnarkom, whatever you want to say, the Ukrainian Soviet Republic was created. You can't argue with that. But actually, before that, there was the Ukrainian People's Republic, which was created by Vinichenka and Petliura, or maybe first Vinichenka. Well, the Central Rada proclaimed Vinichenka and Petliura were the leader. And also, on the territory of Galicia, where Poland, the state, emerged, uh, there was the Western Ukrainian People's Republic. And why do we consider the beginning of Ukrainian statehood? Okay, so we're not going to count Khmelnytsky. That's it. We're forgotten about that. Why do we consider the beginning of Ukrainian statehood to be the Soviet Republic and not uh, the other Ukrainian Republic, which was actually created earlier? Well, because the Bolsheviks decimated it. And, uh, well, so what? In this case, it doesn't matter at all. And um, again, um, Ilyin's idea about leading and guided nation appears. Uh, and uh, it did not arise out of thin air. Of course, it was very widespread in the first half of the 20th century. And now, as we see, unfortunately, it arises again. That is the people who deserve their own state, who are considered to be those who once let it be very long ago, uh, had this state. Poland uh, was created as 
an independent state after the collapse of the Russian Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, because once before in the 18th century, the Polish state existed. And about Ukraine, let's say diplomats didn't have a very good idea what it is even. Uh, Lloyd George said, uh, I once saw a Ukrainian, and I hope I never see one again, since there was no state, that's it. You will be a minority on the territory of Poland, on the territory of Russia, and that's all. And all this applied not only to Ukraine. You can look at the Middle East, where the Kurds were treated the same way, for which uh, we're in the middle of the 19th century. There were uh, two and a half million Kurds. There are now 40 today, more than 45 million. And there were even talks about, after the First World War, to create a Kurdish state. Uh, when the Ottoman Empire was collapsing, but they didn't have one before, so let them be. And then, hence the terrible tragedy of the Kurds in Iraq, hence the terrible tragedy of the Kurds in Turkey, Kurdish terrorism, many, many other things. And this very approach that we respect only those who had, who once had a state, even if it was in the Asian world, why? Everything is changing. New states are created. Some earlier, some later. Uh, no, we will only look at what we need. And of course, I, I don't know, I won't say it, the cherry on the cake, the crown, the hypothesis of all these propaganda view of history is uh, the question of who started it? Who started World War II? This is where all these lines converged. We have always been attacked by everyone. We have always been wronged by everyone, and we are terrible victims. But at the same time, we are the creators. We will fight back, and so on, and so on, and so forth. There are various political scientists, uh, philologists, political scientists, who uh, analyzed uh, statements in the 1990s by Yeltsin and others about the war and uh, in the 2000s. And it is very well shown that Yeltsin, when he spoke to veterans on May the 9th, uh, he talked about the fate of the Soviet uh, people, self-sacrifice, things like that. Putin talks more and more about the state every year. This is not something he came up with. One said, uh, once again, I have already spoken many times in different lectures and different interviews about the striking book, Late Stalinism, by Evgeny Dobranka, where a whole chapter is devoted to how victory began to be perceived after uh, the end of the war, with what incredible speed uh, propaganda strangled everything alive and people needed to shout. Everybody had post-traumatic stress disorder, needed to shout out what they had experienced in the war. That's how wonderful Dobremka writes that the triumph was about the victory, not the tragedy, the triumph. And by the large, uh, Putin continues this, there were different periods between Stalin's times and modern times. There were the 60s and 70s when the so-called lieutenant prose emerged, when many wonderful movies about the war were made, when they started trying to show the war in a more human way. But today, this old Stalinist view is revived and wins again. The state won, the leader won, and the army which the leader guided won, not people. There were heroes. So Ekmedelyanska, the invented Panfilovtsi, and others who sacrificed themselves, of course, for the sake of the state. And that's it. In uh, 2020, Putin, um, she wrote an article, this article, 75 years of the great victory, shared responsibility before history and the future. A lot of interesting things were said there, but the first thought was, the victory over Nazism was won first and foremost by the Soviet people. Well, this is a favorite idea that has always been repeated at all times. It has 
always been said, and you see there were some polls when Americans were asked on whose side Russia fought in the Second World War, and a fairly large percentage said that it was on Hitler's side. Ha ha ha, they don't know anything. It would be interesting to do such a poll in Russia today and ask what people think about which side America fought on. I think there would be some interesting answers. Of course, the role of land lease, the giant aid that the Soviet Union received, is deliberately glossed over. There is a conscious failure to recognize the incredibly difficult war that the Americans fought in the Pacific with a huge number of casualties, the British war in North America with a huge number of casualties. Well, finally, you know, when it is said all the time that only the Soviet Union, only the Soviet Union fought. Actually, let's not forget that there was a time when, in general, the only country opposing Hitler was uh, Great Britain. When Poland was invaded, France was invaded, and the British held out under uh, savage bombings before the Soviet Union entered the war on the right side. Um, next, what uh, else is William Dreamer telling us here? Uh, the deep causes of World War II largely stemmed from decisions made in the wake of the World War I. Well, you can't argue with that. It's certainly true. The Treaty of Versailles was very unfair. Germany was declared completely at fault, Germany was humiliated, Germany was deprived of land, Germany was deprived of the army, but it also contributed to the rise of Hitler and the spread of the propaganda. It's all accurate. It is true, though, but uh, it is not the whole truth. And it's presented as the complete absolute truth who will turn out to be solely to blame, the collective West? The UK and the US, uh, the financial industrial circles were very active and in investing capital in German factories and plants that produced military products. And among their aristocracy and political establishment there were many supporters of radical extreme right wing nationalist movements. True. He goes on to talk about the weakness of the League of Nations, uh, which failed true. It's all true about the Munich Agreement. And like many, then begins the stunning performance. And like many of the leaders of Europe, uh, Stalin did not tarnish himself with a personal meeting with Hitler, who was then heard of in Western circles as a quite respectable politician, was a welcome guest in European capitals. But we did some uh, research and found out uh, with which statesman Hitler met. He met with Mussolini, of course. He met with the Romanian king who had to discuss oil with him, which uh, the Germans were very keen on. Uh, he met with the dictators, uh, let's say the Hungarian dictator. Hungary was a satellite of Nazi Germany, as we say now. Uh, he met uh, with uh, the Czech um, the Czech president, who was forced to meet with him because he had been summoned to Berlin to recognize the future takeover of Czechoslovakia. He met with the Austrian chancellor, who had to recognize the takeover of Austria. That's it. Yes, he met with uh, Chamberlain in Munich, but uh, Deladier is not on this list, Peter, because Deladier was a foreign minister. His line of work requires him to meet with um, anyone. Yes, Chamberlain uh, scrambled and believed that Munich would bring peace, and we know how that ended. But he was expected everywhere. And to say uh, what's interesting even more here is the picture of those European capitals, the capitals that Hitler visited before the outbreak of uh, the World War II, before September the 1st, 1939. He visited Rome, where his ally Mussolini was. He visited Vienna after Austria was taken over by German forces. He visited Prague after Czechoslovakia was taken over. That's it. No open arms. 
We can say he also visited Paris in 1940 when Paris would be captured. And uh, so uh, these uh, sort of like seemingly correct words begin, but in fact, there are clever twists and turns. Next, uh, wild things uh, come next, and uh, what he said about Poland and uh, repeated now in an interview with Carlson uh, is that in Poland, this is in an article for the 75th anniversary, Poland realized that without Hitler's support, its invasion plans would have been doomed to failure. So Poland is turning into the kind of aggressor of a European scale that uh, relies on Hitler's support to annex new lands. Yes, indeed, the Polish regime does not appeal to me at all. The pre-war one, it was nationalistic, anti-Semitic, so authoritarian. So in Poland, is Poland a victim of World War II? Yes, in 1938, indeed, the Poles grabbed a piece of Czechoslovakia, but before that, they were forced to sign a treaty with Germany, which is uh, now stabbing Putin in the eye, uh, forced because uh, uh, they were traveling before Germany, which was going to take them over and did that. Uh, in those dramatic days of 1938, uh, meaning after Munich, only the USSR interceded for Czechoslovakia. Yes, the USSR was ready to intercede, but Poland and Romania refused to let Soviet troops through their territory. I wonder why. Maybe because the Soviet Union, that Soviet Russia, had already tried to invade Poland in 1920, maybe because uh, it had claimed Bessarabia, maybe they were afraid of the Soviets. The Soviet Union, uh, let, let's move on, uh, about the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. The Soviet Union tried to use any chance to create an anti-Hitler uh, coalition to the last possible opportunity, despite the personal position of the uh, Western countries. What is meant by this? When Poland was invaded in 1939, excuse me, when Czechoslovakia was invaded in the beginning of 1939, Chamberlain realized how dead end uh, this idea of appeasement uh, of the aggressor was and gave big guarantees to Poland. And at that moment, they decided to try to negotiate with the Soviet Union. A diplomatic mission was sent for negotiations, but of course, it was not representative enough. It was certainly a mistake, but it's clear why it was made, because the Soviet Union was not trusted. Not only that, when this mission arrived in the USSR, by this time, uh, Maxim Litvinov, the same one who had promoted the idea of collective security in the League of Nations, who was known for this anti-fascist views, had uh, defiantly had defiantly been removed as commissar of foreign affairs, and he was replaced by Molotov, Salvin's little dog, who was known for his pro-German views. Diplomats who always react to such calls, and it was very understood that nothing would come out of these negotiations. And then, as we know, as soon as this mission left, Ribbentrop flew, and in the model of Ribbentrop Pact, was concluded. Molotov Rubin Trump in August uh, 1939, a week before the German attack on Poland. It turns out that they wanted a coalition to the last. Well, when they, nothing else worked out, they had to negotiate with Hitler. In the current situation, the Soviet Union signed a non-aggression treaty. In fact, it was the last of the countries of Europe to do so. What was the last of the countries of Europe? Who was it that signed a non-aggression pact with Hitler? Yes, the Poles signed a treaty. Trembling England had a treaty with Hitler, too. It was a naval agreement that uh, determined the, um, that determined the percentage of the German and the British fleet. That's a non-aggression pact, and certainly not the Treaty of Friendship and Borders that would be signed in September 1939, when the Soviet Union and Germany would amicably partition Poland together. There was nothing like that. 
And there it begins. Were there any secret protocols of annexes to the agreements of a number of countries with the Nazis? That's a great phrase there. People read a number of countries, maybe an agreement with the Nazis. Oh, they must have all colluded there. Who did that? Who exactly? Was it that there were secret protocols to the maritime agreement? That there were secret protocols to the treaty, to the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact? We know about them. And according to these uh, secret protocols, as we know, they divided Europe's spheres of influence and agreed on who would seize what territories. Implying that we don't know, isn't it time for the British to declassify what? It's a game. It's a provocation. What's going on here is to mess with people's heads. Uh, it's gray there too, further down there. Uh, here, that's when it became clear that the Western countries don't want to help. Uh, well, um, they signed the treaty and then Hitler attacks Poland. But the Soviet Union doesn't want to attack Poland. It's very peace-loving. Oh, how come? And on September 17, the truth entered Poland, occupied Ukraine, the Russian lands. It turns out that only when it finally became clear that Britain and France were not eager to help their ally, and the Wehrmacht was uh, able to quickly occupy all of Poland, that is when the danger for us arose. Oh, 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 not the Wormhardt will occupy all of the Poland, and then we had to enter the war. Well, as in voluntarily again defend ourselves, we had to occupy part of Poland in order to do so. But wait, the Wormhardt wasn't going to occupy all of the Poland for the simple reason that you agreed with it. Molotov and Ribbentrop agreed on who was taking over which territories. That's not true either. But further on in this article, in this ingenious phrase that then came the incorporation of Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia, their accession to the USSR. Incorporation. You know what a beautiful word, better than Anschluss. Their accession to the USSR was realized on a contractual basis with the consent of the elected authorities. That's true. Yes. The parliament and government of Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia asked to join the USSR. Why, one wonders. Maybe because before that they were also forced to conclude agreements with the USSR. According to these agreements, the Red Army entered the territories of the Baltic states, which quickly controlled the elections, and the pro-Soviet forces were in the government and did what they were told to do. I mean, you know, yes, on a contractual basis, but that's a lie. By the way, it's just like the Crimean referendum. There was a referendum. What else do you want? And the fact that it was illegal, the fact that it contradicted the constitution of Ukraine, the fact that it was held at gunpoint, the referendum happened. That's all. That's how this lie is formed in the article. Then it will be elsewhere and in real life, too. And uh, very similar things. This article was in 2020, and Putin just said very similar things to Tucker Carlson. In 1939, after Poland cooperated with Hitler, and Poland did cooperate with Hitler, and Hitler offered to make peace with Poland. We have all the documents in our archives, a treaty of friendship and alliance, but demanded that Poland gives back to Germany the so-called Denzig, uh, the narrow corridor that connected the main part of Germany with Königsberg and East Prussia. Well, Hitler wanted to give them a piece of territory, especially uh, links to Prussia. But the fact that this is the territory of Poland, that the borders were determined by the Treaty of Versailles, well, it all remains behind the scenes. After the World War I, this part of the territory was given to Poland, and the city of Gdansk appeared instead of Tunzik. Next, of course, is an incredible phrase. Uh, God's lightheaded when I read this one. Uh, although it would seem you can get used to it. Hitler backed them to give it to him peacefully. The Poles refused. 
Well, Hitler asked them nicely, give it to them, come on. And those aggressors refused. And, well, in addition to the fact that there is a manipulation of historical facts everywhere, juggling, mixing very clever truths and lies, it is immoral. It is immoral to say such things. Well, it's fine. What am I saying? It's funny. Who am I addressing? But if we go back to this article, 75 years of the great victory, all the conclusions of all these discussions, there is a beautiful phrase. It's unfair to say that Ribbentrop's two-day visit to Moscow is the main reason for the war, the main reason for the Second World War. But nobody says the main cause, but it's certainly one of the most important ones. And I really like the word dishonest here as a teacher. I noticed this thing a long time ago. There are always kids in any class who are awfully fond of the word unfair. Oh, that's unfair. You didn't sign us that. Oh, it's an affair. It didn't do that. These are usually the ones who say, don't think cheating is dishonest. Uh, what do we do is fair and what do you do is dishonest. It's about the same here. Everything is right about the Treaty of Versailles, about Munich. But the only problem is that all of these, um, all these things have long been recognized by Western historical science, by Western politicians, recognized as dead ends. Maybe we should think about recognizing at least a part of the Soviet Union's responsibility for what happened. No, because we are always the victims. We suffered the most during the war. We have the most victims, which is true. But the casualties probably could have been less if the infantry had been kept out of the minefields. But still, there are a lot of casualties. Of course, the war was certainly terrible. But the casualties don't cancel out everything else. It doesn't uh, cancel uh, the infamous malt of Robin Trout pack. It doesn't cancel its infamous protocols and everything that goes with it. Germany went through this after the Second World War when uh, the Germans uh, had a defense reaction, a victim complex. We suffered too. We suffered from bombings. We suffered from robberies. Uh, our women were raped. Uh, um, that's how much we suffered too. And why do they blame us for everything? And this, this position makes life easier. Because if you are an unfortunate victim, they should all feel sorry for you. And you do whatever you want to. It's also very interesting with victims. In, uh, in 2012, back on May 9th, Putin spoke at the Red Square parade and said, we have a great moral right to uh, principled and persistent defense of our positions because it was our country that took the brunt of Nazism, met it with heroic resistance. Uh, yeah, uh, met it with heroic resistance uh, went through the most difficult trials, determined the very outcome of the war, uh, crushed the enemy and brought liberation to all people of the world. Uh, what can be said? The sacrifices were very great. Not only the Soviet Union suffered terrible hardships, not only the Soviet Union lost many people, there were countries that were under occupation longer for example, France since 1940, Holland since 1940. There were countries that suffered incredible sacrifices. Um, the American army, the British army, the troops of free France fought heroically. That's one, that's number one. And number two, to say that only the USSR saved the world is not true. Because there is a very big question whether the Soviet Union could have won without the help of the other countries, of the anti-Hitler coalition. This is a very, very big question. And it is not by chance that Stalin 
was ready to ally with Britain, with America, and uh, they were ready because they also realized that we must fight together. And now it turns out that only the Soviet Union won. And the Soviet Union brought liberation to all people of the world. Well, first of all, not all, not everywhere. The Soviet Union did not liberate anyone in North Africa or in the Pacific Ocean, but the Soviet Union brought liberation and at the same time, at the same time brought its enslavement to the countries of Eastern Europe. And this is a terrible tragedy because it was born with both liberation and enslavement. And I think that when the political passions subside, historians will study this contradiction, this duality of the situation when the Red Army brought a liberation and at the same time uh, brought a new dictatorship. And until we recognize this, no truth about the world will be told. And it seems to me that this is a moral, that is mockery of the memory of those uh, who died fighting fascism. However, well, however, the authorities act differently. A new concept of uh, genocide of the, uh, of the Soviet people has recently appeared. It is clear that uh, this is such an ideological response, say, to the Ukrainian claim that uh, the Holodomor is the genocide of the Ukrainian people. And this is also such a pushback uh, to the um, Holocaust. And the anti-Semitic strain, as we know, is present very strongly. Remember these nasty anti-Semitic jokes by Putin? It's all there. And now a memorial is opening in St. Petersburg, where it says, it's in memory of the peaceful inhabitants of the Soviet Union, victims of the Nazi genocide. Political, political scientist uh, Konstantin Bahaluk analyzes the situation in a very interesting way. He writes that uh, what is happening is that we are the main winners of Nazism, and in addition meaning we are the main victims of Nazism, is added. Here is the Soviet Union, Soviet people, the Holocaust, the tragedy of Poland, uh, and uh, the tragedy of Poland and Soviet people. Pohaluk recently writes, any in-depth study of Nazi crimes leads to unpleasant parallels for the Russian authorities. They began with the extermination of the opposition and demagoguery about the conspiracy of the world's financial elite, and continued with the persecution of homosexuals and Jehovah's Witnesses. The Nazi leadership regarded the Poles and an artificial nation just as Z propagandists paint modern Ukraine. Uh, well, However, as we know, uh, we now have a sentence uh, for comparison with fascist ideology, with the fascist state. For some reason, we have to defend ourselves against it. It's an interesting question, why? And Poiluk writes, after a decade of appeals to be guided by our heroes, the Russian authorities have decided to form self-awareness of victims and the citizens uh, who endured a series of injustices centuries after century. If we look at it, we see that, a very important thing, we will see that in Medinsky and Turgenov textbook, I wonder if he puts it in a quotation marks, uh, embitterment of resentment is one of the central lines and meaning. And it's not just the textbook. I have the feeling that in most of the present statements, this um, bitterness and uh, resentment are the most important things. We have a great mission given to us by God, by someone else, by history, by fate, and we're being hindered all the time. Well, since you are hindering us, we will show you. And for this, purpose. It means that we are great, we have ennobled everyone, everyone attacks us, uh, we are heroes, and we are victims.
that are all fever tricks of propaganda. This is roughly what really happened in Nazi Germany, when before the invasion of Poland, they printed about the Poles uh, were attacking the Germans, and it did happen, but uh, they just inflated it tenfold and then used it as one of the justifications for the invasion. Uh, and what I find very depressing is that this propaganda wants to turn us all into something that is part of something higher. That is, we have to believe that we are, first of all, important. Our lives, our interests, our aspirations, because we are part of the Russian world, part of the Orthodox world, part of the state, and so on and so forth. That each of us separately is a grain of sand, unimportant, unnecessary. And we're only a part of this great Russia. And this is not, this is not true. Because every one of us who speaks Russian, Ukrainian, or Belarusian, or Mongolian, or Yakut, or uh, Kazakh, each of us is interesting and important in its own way. And we cannot be sacrificed. We cannot be thrown into the crucible of war. We cannot be bombed. We cannot be killed in the colony or outside of it. Because each of us is valuable. Not the Russian world and not the Russian idea. Uh, Timothy Snyder, mm, well, he was making a point about Ukraine. But I think that phrase applies not only to the Ukrainian situation, but to Putin's propaganda in general. He said, uh, foreign dictators don't, uh, foreign dictators don't have the right to tell you who you are. So even if Mr. Putin were a historian, which he's not, actually, you don't have the right to tell another country what it is after you've read a couple of books or written an essay yourself. And that to me is the most important thing. And it's not just that obviously Putin is not a historian, Putin doesn't understand anything about history. The main thing is that he manipulates history for his own political purposes. And that is not allowed. That's why I put different historians, ancient uh, historians, uh, Herodotus, well, the Muse Cleo, Herodotus, uh, Takisus, uh, Kremzin, the great French historian Marc Bloch, uh, who was killed by the fascists, and many others. And I will allow myself to say on their behalf, leave history alone. Do not turn it into propaganda. It will not serve your dirty purposes. Well, thank you, friends. I see uh, there are some questions already going on here. I'm going to answer them now. And for those who want to ask more questions, you can go to the website. Well, we jokingly call it uh, cops.com, cops.com. <laughs> Type in the code 615-619-0000. Six one nine zero eight, and you can ask a question in the question box there. If you're in Russia, you need to enable VPN. And I am going to start to start answering questions now. <clears throat> okay. And. I don't see them. Oh, 
on one more one moment one moment oh not that Uh oh. Uh huh. Well, I can see it. And here is the link that they sent me. I'm going to. That's the wrong link. That's not the link to the questions. So, uh huh. So, in your lectures on a Turk, you admire him even though he is now different from the other 20th century dictators. You know, I don't admire at a Turk. I just see the complexity of his personality. If you listened carefully to my lecture, you probably heard me start with the fact uh, that before I came to Turkey, I had a much lower opinion of the Turk. Then I saw how much he did for Turkey. And that's the dialectic of the complexity of the story. Uh, he was a dictator, but he modernized the country, and I, I'm, I'm not placing any emphasis. Watch the video on Yulia Navalny. I feel very sorry for her, the children. Everyone, I admire her strengths. I admire her strengths too, and it's absolutely amazing. Uh, so I think I'm... Um, um, no. Uh huh. Is civil war possible in Russia? And if so, how soon could it be? Well, you know, I always say that Russia is about, uh, that history is about the past, not the future. Well, you see, well, I stopped saying that something is impossible after uh, 20. Uh, 2022, February the 24th, I don't say that anymore. It turns out that everything is possible now. But, well, I don't think there's a reason for that here. I mean, I'd like to think that. I'm a, former, I'm a former employee of a local history museum in the Lugansk region and a future educator. How can we help children absorb less of the cannibalistic anti-historical narrative both at home and at school? simply by confronting these norms. It's uh, very well understood about everyday life. Well, for example, respect children, students, uh, treat them as people, as people uh, worthy of respect, whatever they say, whatever they do, listen to them and also build their work in school. What do I do if my political opinion does not coincide with the political opinion of my friends, relatives? Uh, video about Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia. Oh, oh, oh. Um, it's very sad. The European doesn't coincide with them. And you see, I can't advise you anything because I don't know you or your relatives, but I can say that I was very impressed by Elena Krasichenko's interview with Yuri Dude, and in particular where she talks about how she builds relationship with her mother, who doesn't understand her at all, how she argues with her, but she never forgets that they love each other. It seems to me that we have to learn to keep this balance. It doesn't mean that I don't agree that one should not say anything at all, keep silent, avoid it, no. But to speak and to keep respect. Well, if we're not talking about very old relatives, then they should be left alone. Will Putin's physical removal help establish a new order and order in Russia? Or is it an archaeocracy and not an autocracy? Well, you know, when Putin is gone in some way, of course, change will begin. But just replacing Putin with anyone else doesn't change anything. There has to be huge changes, changes in institutions, changes in values, changes in attitudes towards aggression. It's a huge, hard, long job. Today, Yulia Navalny is jokingly compared to Princess Olga. Oh, that's the thing. Why is everyone talking about Princess Olga? I would not compare Yulia Navalny to Princess Olga. 
because um, Olga, if you believe the chronicle tale, uh, shed a huge amount of blood avenging her husband. I think that uh, Yulia Navalny will follow the principle, um, the principle of her husband, who was always in favor of nonviolent resistance. What do you expect in the March 2024 elections? Well, I expect huge falsifications, huge use of administrative resources, and, and so on and so forth. I won't be able to fulfill the Xenia Malny's call and show up at 12 noon on March 17th to the polling station. But I think this is a good way to do it. It will not change the parish, will not change the outcome of the election, but it will show that there are those who disagree. If there are hope of saving long-suffering Russia from the oppression of that monster, the spawn of darkness, Putin, I'm convinced that there is always hope. I terribly, I'm terribly depressed, mortified, uh, destroyed by the death of Alexei Navalny. But I'm convinced that we can continue to fight. Why is the perception of propaganda and true history by Russians much sharper now than during the Soviet Union? Vitaly from Ukrainian Kyiv. Thank you. Uh, because depends on which period of the Soviet Union we take. Propaganda was incredibly strong and energetic and permitted everything under Stalin. If we're talking about the Brezhnev era, it was a tired state. No one really believed in this ideology. They themselves, the propagandists, did not really believe it. So accordingly, they let everyone live, and now they are trying to reach everyone. And they hit some pain points with the greatness of Russia, the Russian spirit, with all this. And the people reacting. I wonder why Solzhenitsyn was favorable to Putin. Uh, after all, Putin is an extension of the Soviet Union. Also, why is Solzhenitsyn's wife silent? And I suddenly wondered, is she still alive? I don't remember. Yes, it is also strange that Solzhenitsyn, a former convict who hated the NKVD so much, turned out to favor Putin towards the end of his life. But obviously, he did not seem uh, him as a KGB man, but as a bearer of such ideals of traditional Russia, of strong power, which were all close to him. It's very sad. Why is the perception of propaganda? So that was already there. Next one. How do you feel about the monstrous statement made by Russian politicians towards Kazakhstan? Isn't that how the Ukraine conflict started? Well, you know, I am um, greatly worried and uh, I'm outraged. Again, I really want to hope that this is just chatter, you know, like with the finite agreements. And again, I have to say that um, I can't talk anymore. It's impossible. I was in Kazakhstan in the fall. And I was struck by the friendliness and interest of the locals. What struck me was that I spoke in many places, in many parts of the former Soviet Union. And um, Kazakhstan was the only place where people who had fled there from Russia, they came to the microphone after my lecture and said, thank you, Kazakhstan that made the strongest impression on me. Well, I'm not talking about the other factors that how all the people who fled were received. It's amazing. And that probably pisses off the authorities too. Well, I really hope that um, the hands are short, but. Will Yulia Lavalina be able to be close to important women in Russian politics, like Galina Sarabotova and Valeria Novodvorska? It seems to me, yes. First of all, she's a very strong woman. You can see that. She has always been close to her husband. She understood and understands his ideas. I think there will be people who will help her. Okay. 
Why is there no popularization of Birch Bark's uh, chill everyday life, relationships, and how our languages diverged? But that's a very complicated question linguistically. It is so too wide for amateurs. Uh, it is um, it is for amateurs. It is very it is a sorry a uh, domestic question. Let me get back to it. From Bilatsarkva with Berdansk in my heart. How I love Bilatsarkva. I was there with my dad many years ago and with my mom. Where are we rolling and will it hurt to roll? It's gonna hurt either way. The question next is that what we're going to do with this pain. Are we going to paddle it or malign it or are we going to build something new? So can stories about historical events to comic books form popularized history? Mm. A dialogue with the guy Stalin is bad for repression. What you know, everybody is very much into comic books nowadays. It's completely incomprehensible to me, and it seems uh, something so primitive to me. And there is a whole culture of comics. There is very adult, very serious comics. Maybe it can help. Why do Russia and other countries hate LGBT people? How do you feel about LGBT people? Well, you know, I I support LGBT rights for everything in um, every way possible. It's not an issue at all. I'm very proud that I participated in Pride in Norway this fall. Um, it was very important to me that I was called there. But it's wrong to see that uh, Russia and other CIS countries hate LGBT people. Uh, what do you mean how can an entire Russia hate? Yes, homophobia is very widespread unfortunately, as in any traditional country. And the state inflates it, that's true. But I assure you, first of all, both in Russia and in the CIS countries, there is a huge number of LGBT people. And there are many who perceive this as a normal situation. Um, I assure you, I know what I'm talking about. I know a fair number of these people. To me, as a resident of Estonia, are Europe's fears about the future of the Baltic states fair? How can Putin justify potential aggression? Well, it will be easy for him to justify it, of course. There were part of the empire too. A lot of Russian people live there. Um, all these nations are led, uh, for God's sake. Um, but it seems to me that it is going to a direct clash with NATO. And it seems to me that it will not happen. Why are you sitting next to Putin on the cover? <laughs> because, um, Look at the movie Dog Heart. I'm sitting like Professor Prepozhensky and Putin is sitting like Sharikov. So where to find and how to introduce independent history textbook to children? Can it be done in public schools? Uh, well, you know, you can. There's a lot of great stuff on the internet. Uh, well, for example, if we're talking about the 20th century, then of course the most objective the most objective narrative is uh, of the textbook written by Leonid Alexandrovich uh, Kotzva. Well, I don't know how old your children are. It's a difficult text for high school students, of course, but um, it seems to me that uh, they need to develop critical thinking no matter what textbook they have in school. Look, it says this. Uh, how convincing is this? What evidence does the author cite? And look at this, there are other sources. And you can always find sources on the internet and then the child will further analyze it himself. And you can, um, not even necessarily on some painful topics, but you can, you can develop critical thinking on any topic. I don't know, there is a brilliant textbook on uh, uh, the Middle Ages by Boitsov and Shukurov. Uh, it's a completely harmless topic. It's available on the internet, and um, there are a lot of uh, assignments for working with sources for developing thinking. I know that all historical parallels are conditional. There is some period in the history or other history uh, similar to what's happening in Russia today. You know, I don't like these parallels. Yes, we can say that Russia is now slipping. Well, actually, it has already slipped to fascism. It is slipping there, let's put it this way, that the authoritarian regime in Russia is becoming more and more rigid. It can be compared to Stalin's regime, to Hitler's regime, but thank God we have not yet reached such volumes of terror. 
but uh, we see how the situation is getting worse every day. I wanted to know if there would be a lecture on the history of Ukraine as part of the USSR. And I have these lectures. I have lectures about Ukraine in the 1920s, 1930s. I have a lecture coming out soon about Bandera, about the war. Well, uh, it's difficult because not much time has passed uh, yet, and, uh, but I'll try. Why is information about mass repression being destroyed in Russia? Because uh, those who are in power today, um, they are sometimes uh, descendants in their direct sense and sometimes spiritually descendants of those who shot in Sindermach, in Butovo, and other places. So they don't want to preserve it. How could Navalny's death affect the political regime? Could a civil war break out? Well, I don't think a civil war over Navalny's death will start, but I would say it's not the death that affects the political regime, but this is the manifestation of change. This is the manifestation of the dramatic tightening of the regime. How do you raise children in Russia these days? Oh, that's a very difficult question. I sympathize with you very much. And again, I can't give specific advice. I don't know you or your children, how old they are, where you live, uh, what school they go to. I know one thing, you can't lie to your children. You don't have to tell them you'll grow up and then we'll discuss it with you. You can discuss any topic with your child. Tell them your opinion. And then you can discuss with them, if you say this at school, to understand the risks and something like that. If you are ready for it, I will support you. If not, I will support you as well. Unfortunately, I can't advise anything else. What can I suggest as a substitute for talking about important things? So I have conversations about important things with Tamara Edelman on Sundays. I take these very topics and uh, give a different perspective on them. I treasure these conversations. I think they raise very important topics. But the question is how to discuss them. That's what I'm doing. So this has already happened about Navalny said. I am waiting for a lecture about the UNR, as historian of Ukrainian history of the 20th century. Uh, I had a lecture about Ukraine during the Civil War. So, well, maybe we'll come back to that at some point. Will there be an issue on Stalinist propaganda? Um, there's a sewing schedule in the press. Well, I don't know about the sewing schedule. I have a book about propaganda. Um, yes, I have a book. I have an offline lecture that I'm giving. Um, well, someday we'll put it on. We'll put it on the internet too. Very worried about Putin's latest remarks. They've uh, they've started to build fortifications. Thank you again. Thank you. Uh, well, fortification is probably unnecessary, but actually. Uh, I think everyone should be on guard. No, evil will not prevail. I'm convinced of that, too. I have a lecture that I travel to different cities and countries with, will good triumph or over evil? Spoiler, it won't. Okay. Next. Or is it that? Will there be a lecture on Gaddafi? Oh, interesting. How do you fight the distortion of history in school? I don't want to go to school because of it. 10th grade student from Belarus. Well, again, I can't advise you, but you have to get up and tell a teacher. Um, that's up to each individual, and I understand perfectly well what huge risks are behind it. We'll read books, look for information on the internet, subscribe to the channel History Lessons with Tamara Edelman and many other historical channels and create a counterweight. How and where do you choose your popular and scientific books, scientific articles, monographs? I have a very hard time answering the question. Well, it depends on what the topic is. Uh, it's very funny. I start with Wikipedia. I open the Russian Wikipedia article and I really like the English Wikipedia, which is much better. 
and I immediately look at the literature. There are usually some basic things written there. Next, I find some books from the ones there, and I go further from there, some more links. And other. I lecture about Alain Delon. <gasps> Alain Delon speaks French. It's unexpected, uh, to put it bluntly, I know. I'll have to think about it. So it wasn't planned that way. That's it. Is that it? What's the next for all of us? How do we find the strength not to break? I don't know what's in store for all of us. It is clear to me that the victory of uh, light forces will not happen in one second. How to find strength and not to break down? I answer myself with the words of Viktor Frankl, who believed that, uh, first of all, in any situation, one can somehow find the meaning of existence for oneself. He said that we see that even dying people, even surviving prisoners of camps, find meaning for themselves. And he believed that um, doing uh, work, creative work, well, not writing poetry, and any work that you put your heart into, and socializing with people close to you. Those are the things that help you survive. I feel that every day. Okay. It doesn't go any further for me. Uh-huh. Well... Everyone says it's time to wrap it up. Thank you so much to everyone who's been here. I, I hope you put likes so that as many people as possible will watch this lecture. And, uh, I don't know. and let's remember Alexei Navalny and the fact that he urged us not to give up.